All right, what we're going to do today is get an airplane out of the hangar, get our motor running. We're going to taxi to the end of the runway, do our cigar tip takeoff checklist controls, free and full range instruments set, gas on and level, altimeter set to the field elevation or the barometric pressure. And then we're going to do our run-up at 1750 RPM. We're going to do the tip part of our checklist. Trim set for takeoff. Interior locked. And propeller forward to the max power RPM position. Then we're going to take off. And what we're going to do today is some cross control maneuvering. We're maneuvering across the runway from runway light to runway light. Now if this looks a little rough, you'll note the windsock is straight out and perpendicular to the runway. We were taught to do this in harsh conditions by our World War II instructors at Ayers so that on good days it would be a snap to do extreme maneuvering. What can you do with it? Well, if you're doing any kind of low-level work that requires terrain following, you can do so with confidence. And with this kind of training, you may have some opportunities that others simply won't have and be able to see outs for yourself that others simply won't see. If you're one of the A-10 instructor pilots from Dothan, you'll recognize this field. It's where we went through cross control live, first in Stearman 291 and then in various other aircraft. But of course first, we all start in the chair. Hard to get killed in a chair. Next we'll move to a static airplane. We're going to try this in. Control yoke or stick will be fine. Nose left, left rudder, right aileron. Nose right, right rudder, left aileron. You try it. Nose left. Nose right. Which direction are we flying? We're flying to the right. The big rudder on a Cessna 180 makes it an excellent trainer for cross control. Where did these techniques come from and how the, were they developed? If you guessed World War I, you were right. These pilots were flying rotary engines where the propeller is simply bolted to the engine and the entire engine spins around a stationary crankshaft. They learned this set up a gyroscopic effect. And by sudden control movements, they could spin the airplane completely around the gyro by using the well-known force vector of 90 degrees. One of these pilots was General George Kinney, pictured with his World War I flying unit and trained by the legendary Bert Acosta, a.k.a. Bad Boy of the Air, for his numerous infractions, taking off across runways, buzzing steeples, flying under bridges, and the like. Kinney, described as a pirate born 300 years too late, knew low-level techniques well. So when his aide, Major William Ben, suggested taking a B-17 high-altitude bomber on the deck to skip bomb a ship, he and Ben personally took a B-26 up to try it out. It worked. And after Ben got a squadron trained to fly the big bombers in at 200 feet, 220 mile per hour, and drop 60 to 100 feet from the ships, bomb hits went from 5% to 70%. Kenny's next buccaneer recruit would change the game completely. Paul, Pappy Gunn, was a tactician, technician, out-of-the-box thinker, and motivated man to get things done in a hurry. Few knew his wife and child were held captive in the Philippines. Gunn took off to the Australian bases in a B-25 he named Out of Stock because that's what he was looking for. 
off-book parts he could use to turn the B-25 mid-altitude bomber into the world's best low-level commerce raider by installing 10 to 18 Ford firing 50 caliber machine guns throwing over 200 pounds of lead per second. These chopped up ships, bomb or no bomb. He had first tried a package of 450s in the A-20, but as one of his pilots and my personal mentor John Boggs said, we loved the A-20's speed, but it couldn't take a hit. Later, Gunn added a 75mm cannon to the nose, a hit with the press and public, but less so with the crews. As Boggs said, it seemed the whole airplane stopped in midair when you touched off that thing, and the cockpit filled with smoke when the loader opened the breech. But all that made the B-25 the beast of the air. The standard run is maintaining altitude until five miles out, then dropping to an altitude of two to five hundred feet. At no less than six hundred yards out, we'll drop to sixty feet, just inside one wingspan, into ground effect, where we have practiced over and over. Can you see the B-25 coming in? It's coming in in ground effect. Try it again. Spot the B-25 coming in in ground effect. What is ground effect and how do we use it? You first encounter ground effect when your instructor shows you what is called a soft field takeoff. You apply flaps, hold the stick back in your lap, apply full power, and as you're going down the runway, you build up a ball of air under the wing and can take off in ground effect before you can fly in clean air. And the object is to build up speed going over the ground until you can do your normal climb. This ball of air sets up behind the wing spar. It feels mushy, dangerous. It feels like you're trundling down the runway on a half-filled balloon. The ground effect at speed is quite different. That's the one we're going to use. And I'm talking about speed over maneuvering speed up to full power. This ground effect sets up in front of the spar. You can clearly see it on this aircraft I'm flying here. The wingtip vortices curl up under the wing instead of twirling off into space. It now helps us with our lift. This ball of air is anything but mushy. It's like going down the pike on top of a baseball. Further, we can use the effect on top of the baseball to use cross-control maneuvering. This is what the B-25 pilots were using going in. All right, Captain, you are the best of the best of the best. We're going to do some live flying now. We're going to set our RPM manifold pressure. We're going to be in a B-25. You're in the left seat. I'm in the right seat. I'm going to be taking you down into the field, doing some maneuvering with you. I'll be riding on the controls with you, and then I'm going to tell you you've got it, and you've got it. I want you to note how smooth the flying is going to be, because if it takes three degrees to have one G, everything's at equilibrium, it only takes a rise of three more to get two G's. And the, the key word here is sudden. No herky-jerky movements on that control. We want everything smooth, smooth, smooth. Because you can have, we're going in at over 30,000 pounds, two G's. We've got 60,000 pounds and 
three G's. I don't know about you, but I like to keep the wings on. So we're going to go in smooth. If you make a turn, you make it smooth. You'll see that on the film. You may hear some additional noise. That's the uh, top turret opening up. On the controls, the bottom button is for Canon. I'll handle that on my control and you handle the guns on the top button. Here we go. Left rudder, right aileron, tank shot, neutralize, jump the tree. Right rudder, left aileron. Left rudder, right aileron. Rudder, left aileron. You've got it, it's your airplane, Captain. What if we stall it? Well, for stalls, we must look to FAA Aircraft Circular 120 for guidance. Stalls must be performed at an altitude safe. So what do we do? The best explanation that I ever saw was given by Johnny Neal, flew with Chenault, B-40 instructor at Panama City, along with John Boggs when he was shot down in a B-25 and sent back to the States. Here was his explanation for stalls without losing any altitude. This saved my bacon total of three times, can yours. We're always closer to a stall than we think. And we must be ready to recover from a stall immediately in all cases. No matter whether your wing is level here, here, it does not matter what you lower the nose. It is the only thing that you can do immediately. If you throw the power to the engine, you may get it in a half a second, and you may not get it if the engine balks. In a turbine, it can take a gut-wrenching seven seconds to get power once you throw that power level lever forward. The only thing that you can do immediately is lower the nose. Note I did not say dive to the ground. Put the airplane back in the attitude where it was last flying and you will not lose altitude. You feel that shake, drop the nose. Where it's flying again, mush your way out of it. Sure you're going to do all the other things. Apply power, maybe a notch of flaps, but the very first thing you do, lower the nose. Now he had us go up to altitude above 3,000 feet and practice this over and over until we could deal with a stall without losing altitude. In 1978 I was at Ormond Beach Airport pumping gas and doing light mechanic work when an egg cat flew in with John Boggs at the controls. He was there to take over Twin Cat Corporation and turn what had been originally a 200 
20 horsepower Agcat into a 700 horsepower monster. He overheard one of the young flight instructors say, it was such a shame that Embry-Riddle would hire such an old man to fly. He immediately jumped in that airplane and for the next 45 minutes beat up that airport in an aerial demonstration that would put the Blue Angels or Air Force Thunderbirds to shame. When he taxied back up to the gas pumps, I was there to greet him, and he said, Hey kid, why don't you come to work for me? I could use a hand. Well, of course, I had to work for a guy like that. He had just demonstrated everything pilots normally simply talk about. He could walk the talk. And later, when I was stuck in a dead-end job, he called me up and said, I'm at Ayers Flight School with my old P-40 instructor buddy, Johnny Neal. If you ever want to learn the techniques, now's the time. I jumped at that chance, and of course, it changed the course of my life. John Boggs was with the Far East Air Force at Clark Airfield when it was bombed to smithereens on day one of the war. He took off in a P-40 and was quickly shot down, as most of them were, since the armchair generals had rejected Chenault's tactics. He made it out of the Philippines on one of the repaired B-17s, was assigned to the 7th training and leading pilots and medium bombers until shot down over New Guinea, and when rescued was so emaciated, he was sent to Panama City as a P-40 instructor where he met Johnny Neal. You have been most gracious in allowing me your time. You should know that I am the very last to graduate in my graduating class at high school. In fact, until 3.45 p.m. on graduation day, I didn't know if I was going to graduate at all. My problem was mathematics, gobbledygook to me, and it wasn't until... 20 years later, when I was picking up a degree in an unrelated field, that I find out that 20% of all students do not get abstract thought until they're in their 20s. The frontal lobe does not develop for what you need for mathematics. By then, they're already pigeonholed. If it hadn't been for my parents and grandparents that didn't give up on me, or an organization called D. Malay, where I could concentrate on the things that I could do instead of the things that were trying to be pounded into me, I would have never made it. All that to say this. Never give up on your kid. And if you are that kid, Never give up on yourself. Good luck, and good luck with your flying.
Just one more thing. If on occasion a little pirate comes out, embrace it. It's not such a bad thing. <laughs>